So we're continuing on with the 18th century, and we're following up the Enlightenment and all of those philosophical ideas with some of the political things that are happening in the 18th century. We're leading up to the French Revolution, which ignites in the year 1789. So the philosophical stuff, that gives us a good background for some of the ideas that are going to ignite the French Revolution. What we see in 18th century diplomatic and military history is a shift in the balance of power. First, France is going to become this super state. They're going to try to take over Spain, and Europe's going to respond to get rid of that super state so that France is just France. And then we have the emergence of a new country, a new powerhouse that we really only mentioned briefly in passing before, and that's the rise of the German state of Prussia within the Holy Roman Empire. And these two things unsettle Europe a little bit. Again, there's a shift in the balance of power. There are the important monarchs that come around in the 18th century. We need to know about them. And again, most of this just helps us set up the French Revolution of 1789. All right, so let's get to it. So the first important military conflict that we need to talk about is the decade and a half long war called the War of Spanish Succession. Okay, so let me explain the term here. Succession. That means who succeeds the throne. In, order, in, in other words, who inherits the throne of Spain. So this is a war about who gets to rule Spain. It's a little bit confusing and annoying. In the 18th century, there's the War of Spanish Succession, and then a generation later, also in the 18th century, there's the War of Austrian Succession. I will do my very best to, cl to clearly explain both of these military conflicts. Okay, so let's learn about how the War of Spanish Succession begins. It's a very interesting, kind of humorous story. The War of Spanish Succession begins with the death of this particular individual who is on your screen right now, and if you are able to, look at your screen right now. This is King Charles II of Spain. He is the last Habsburg King of Spain. If you remember, the first Habsburg King of Spain that we learned about was, was King Charles I of Spain, who was also the same man, King or Emperor Charles V of the Holy Roman Empire. We remember a lot about Charles V during the period of time of the Reformation, I had to deal with Martin Luther. The, uh, he was at the Diet of Worms. He fought the Schmalkaldic Wars. He signed the, uh, uh, the, the Peace of Augsburg in 1555, which a lot of people mark as you know, the end of the Reformation era. And of course, he retired uh, the following year and only lives a, a, a year or two more after that. Now, that's Charles V. So if you remember when I was talking about Charles V, I asked you to pay attention to his chin. His chin. He had a huge underbite of a chin, and that was the famous Habsburg chin. Now, the reason why I drew your attention back, or, or drew your attention to his chin back then, wasn't necessarily to make fun of Charles V, but rather that chin, combined with a whole bunch of inbreeding, ends up causing a dynastic crisis and a war in the early 18th century. And that's the War of Spanish Succession. So if you look at this image of King Charles II of Spain, a distant descendant of Charles V, you'll notice that he too has quite an underbite and a large chin. Now, take a moment to look at his family tree. Okay, so there's the family tree of King Charles II of Spain, and you notice that his name is down there on the bottom. Now, you don't need to know anything about the names of the people on this family tree, even though if you look closely at it, there actually should be a few names on there that you recognize. But I just want to talk about the shape of this family tree. Let me talk about your family tree. Now, I don't know your individual families hardly at all, but let me tell you about how your family tree is shaped. If you went up several generations to your, you know, your great, 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 however, great grandparents, well, you'd start off with a man and a woman who then had children, and then their children had children, and then their children had children. And so your family tree is triangle shaped. It starts with a couple on the top and a large base below. Your family tree is not shaped like the family tree of King Charles II of Spain, which is diamond shape. It starts off with two individuals, it goes out a little bit, and then it comes back in because cousins keep marrying cousins. This is what we call inbreeding. And you, if you do this for several generations, you sadly get a child like King Charles II of Spain. 
His story is a rather sad one. He certainly had absolutely nothing to do with the inbreeding that eventually produced him, just like you have nothing to do with the people who met and procreated and became your ancestors. But of course, you are the genetic product of all that coupling. And so was Charles II. When you have enough cousins marrying cousins and you have all this inbreeding, usually, eventually, you have a child like King Charles II. Charles II of Spain, the last Habsburg king of Spain, he was, to say the least, cognitively and physically impaired. Cognitively impaired in that he had the brain and the cognitive functioning of about a two-year-old. Even as an adult man, he thought like an infant, or maybe not an infant, a toddler, or at least a very young child. It made him certainly a very awkward man to be around. He was also physically impaired because he had that excessively large chin and an incredible underbite, he could not chew his own food. But he has to eat in order to survive, right? So in a day and age before blenders, there were literally, for King Charles II, royal chewers. Yes, royal chewers in El Escorial Palace in Madrid to, you guessed it, chew up the food of the king, spit it out into a cup so that he could drink it. Now, the job of the king is to make babies, so he has, has successors, and they called upon some of the Habsburgs and others from the royal and aristocratic lines over in the Holy Roman Empire. Marriages were arranged, but no wife remained with him for long, because even if they could stand being around him and his horrible personality, or at least his infantile personality, these queens of Spain soon figured out that Charles II's chin wasn't the only thing that was physically impaired. He also couldn't perform the necessary duties to procreate so that the royal line of Spain could continue. Charles II of Spain eventually died in the year 1700. He was 39 years old. He was the last Spanish Habsburg. Now the question arises, who will rule Spain? So here's what goes down. Before Charles II died, his sister married the grandson of Louis XIV of France. Even at this wedding ceremony, the Sun King himself stood up after the, after the couple was pronounced man and wife, and Louis XIV proclaimed, Voila le roi d'Espagne. Here he is, the King of Spain. And this is even before Charles II is dead. So when Charles II actually does die, then... You now have an individual who is the rightful inheritor for the, for, the, for the monarchy of France and somebody who is the king of Spain, thus creating the possibility of a super kingdom, one individual who rules both Spain and France. If these two kingdoms combined, they will be the most powerful kingdom on the face of the earth. I mean, think of how much land Spain has, the whole Spanish empire. It spreads across the Americas and East Asia, the Philippines, all that. All of that combined with France, arguably the most powerful country in Europe. So combined, these two countries would be an amazing superpower. So now let me introduce this very important concept in our study of European history. Balance of power. One of the, very, one of the most important questions we can ask at any point in time in history is, how do we maintain peace between countries? How do we avoid war? And of course, this is just as relevant today as it was back in the early 1700s. How do you avoid war? What international system can you set up, or rather can countries set up, to avoid conflict and save human life? Insofar as we value peace, what systems do we put in place to maintain peace? So think about it today in the 21st century. What systems do we have set up either in Europe or across the world to maintain peace, to stop countries from fighting each other? So you might think, well, in Europe, there's the European Union. Yes, that was an organization set up to create peace and harmony between the countries of Europe after World War II. Internationally, there's the United Nations, which also does the same thing or aims to do the same thing. 
to stop war and promote peace in a variety of different ways in between countries. Now, both the EU and the United Nations are rather recent developments. They developed in the 20th century. But what about at earlier times in European history? Well, prior to the Reformation, perhaps the Pope could play some mitigating role into, in creating peace between countries. But after the Reformation and the demise of the power of the papacy to have such an influence over, over countries, then each country becomes its own independent state. And so what we see throughout the duration of European history, throughout most of European history, at least up until the early 19th century, is countries independently trying to keep other countries in check. So for example, if a country gets too big and too powerful, so for example, you know, France and Spain team up to become a country, then this upsets the balance of power. France and Spain have too much power, and what will happen will be other countries will team up against that new super country. But usually the only way to keep a, a, a burgeoning power in check is to go to war with that country. So what we see throughout the 18th century are wars on the continent that occur because one country is getting too powerful. These wars of the 18th century are almost all about balance of power. At least the ones that I'm going to talk about, all of the ones that I'm going to talk about, are about balance of power. Okay, so the War of Spanish Succession starts off in 1701, and it's led by the, by the English. And that's a little bit surprising, because England's sort of doing its own thing, and England tends not to get too involved with conflicts that are on the European continent. If it's happening south of the English Channel, England tends to, tends to leave it alone. But this was an example of England saying what is happening on the continent will eventually affect us. We need to go down there and stop this creation of the superpower. So England pulls together a coalition, a coalition that involves the Habsburgs from the Holy Roman Empire, the Dutch, um, the Portuguese, uh, some Italians, and another new burgeoning power, Prussia, that we'll talk a little bit about later. The military commander that led the English across the channel united this coalition and fought the Spanish and the French, and mostly these battles are occurring on the border between the Holy Roman Empire and France. The Englishman who was the military commander was this man, the Duke of Marlborough. Now, the Duke of Marlborough's real name was John Churchill, and I draw your attention to his birth name, John Churchill, because you might look at that last name and think, if you know anything about English history, especially English history of the 20th century, well, that name sounds kind of familiar. And yes, John Churchill was an ancestor and also an incredible inspiration to Winston Churchill, who was the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom during World War II. Winston Churchill drew his inspiration from John Churchill the Duke of Marlborough, in an important way. And it kind of gives us a, a, a helpful insight into what Britain is thinking during the, the War of Spanish Succession. And it, it also helps us understand Churchill's thinking a little bit in the 20th century. The English tend to like to mind their own business for the most part. They stay up in their British Isles, and they feel a sense of uh, cultural and separation and political separation as well as they, as well as they do geographic separation. They are separate and they're and, and different from the continent, and so they tend not to get too involved on the continent. But there is a sense that with the Duke of Marlborough, no, this will involve, uh, involve us eventually. We need to go and fight the combined French and Spanish force. We need to stop this big superpower from emerging. Okay, Winston Churchill in the 20th century saw the same thing with Hitler. And when many of his English countrymen in the 1920s, 1930s, especially the 1930s, when they weren't paying Hitler any mind, Winston Churchill was. When most of the people of, the, of England wanted peace, Churchill was saying, Winston Churchill was saying, war with Adolf Hitler is going to be inevitable. We need to start preparing our military now. So in both the case of John Churchill and Winston Churchill, we see Britons who are actively rallying their people to invade the continent, to stop the emergence of a superpower on the continent, which will eventually, they believe, become a threat to them 
if they don't. Okay, so the Duke of Marlborough. Hey, for what it's worth, the Duke of Marlborough, John Churchill, he's not just uh, an ancestor to Winston Churchill. He's also a, an ancestor to um, Princess Diana. You may have heard of Princess Diana. She was a very popular princess, uh, wife of, uh, of, of, uh, of Prince Charles, was known for her kindness, her philanthropy. And for many people, it was a, it was a very, very sad thing when, when she died in a fiery car crash in Paris while the paparazzi were chasing her. Uh, that happened in 1997. All right, back in the early 18th century, just to revisit uh, who the monarch of England was, it was the last Stuart monarch. You hopefully remember poor Queen Anne, 17 children and 17 deaths. She outlived all of her children, which is why when she dies, that's the end of the Stuart line. And we have the rise of the Hanoverian dynasty in England after her death in 1714. All right, so I don't say much about the actual fighting that occurs through the 14 years of the War of Spanish Succession, because I don't think there's that much that's significant for what we need to, to know for our understanding of European history. Uh, the Duke of Marlborough was known to be a great inspirational leader of men in battle. I don't know a lot about this. I do know that he used to send the food carts in front of the men so that the men, as they were marching throughout the continent, wherever they, where, whenever they arrived to the camp in the evening, the food was already waiting for them. So later on in history, Napoleon will say that a, an army is led by its stomach. It seems like John Churchill figured that out 100 years before Napoleon. It seemed like John Churchill just knew how to keep morale up with his, with his men. But that's pretty much all I know about it. The War of Spanish Succession. I don't know anything about the battles or anything. But what is important for us to know is, uh, is the consequence of this battle. So Britain and its allies win. So what's this mean? Well, most importantly, it means that forevermore, France and Spain are going to remain two separate countries. They're going to remain, They're going to remain two separate countries. Okay, so what this means is Philip V remains the king of Spain. He gets to keep that title, hooray for you, Philip V, but he is never allowed to be the king of France. So as I look at this slide, I don't really like how it's written here. Philip V remains king of Spain, but renounces all Bourbon affiliations. It should be French affiliation. Spain is to operate independently from France. Um, the fact that France will have its own king and it will not be Philip V should at least in part do that. But what's important to know about Philip V is he's the first Bourbon king of Spain. So from here on out, when we talk about a Spanish monarch, the Spanish monarch is Bourbon. This is the end of the Spanish Habsburgs, and it's the beginning of the Spanish Bourbons. Okay, other things to know. France uh, gets to keep its 1697 borders, but loses part of its uh, Canadian colony to Britain. This will also be an important story of the 18th century, how Britain will eventually take over all of Canada. Now, it doesn't get at all with the end of the uh, War of Spanish Succession. There'll be another major war in which they acquire Quebec. That will be the Seven Years' War a little bit later on. And then the last thing you need to know about the end of the War of Spanish Succession is Britain begins controlling particular islands and seaports on the Iberian Peninsula. This allows Britain to begin having some control over the Mediterranean Sea. This becomes important because when we talk about the Napoleonic Wars, the single most important naval battle happens off the coast of Spain. All right, so, and that's all I have to say about the War of Spanish Succession. Okay, so the War of Spanish Succession is the first major military conflict that occurs in the 18th century. What you're looking at on this slide right here are the big things that you need to know in terms of diplomatic and military history throughout the 18th century prior to the French Revolution. This particular uh, list here doesn't include some of the stuff that Russia is doing. I'll talk about Russia separately. But I want to begin with this particular slide because, first of all, I just want you to see these things lined up and I want you to know that one thing leads to another. So it starts off with the War of Spanish Succession, and then there's a little break there because War of Sp Spanish Succession doesn't really have anything to do with the Pragmatic Sanction. But then we've got the Pragmatic Sanction of 1713, which leads to the War of Austrian Succession, which begins in 1740 and lasts for eight years. And then there is a diplomatic revolution that occurs because of the War of Austrian Succession, and the diplomatic revolution of 1756 then sparks the Seven Years' War of 1756 to 1763. Okay, so I introduce this to you now so that you can sort of put in your head 
that you need to be able to connect the dots here between pragmatic sanction, war of Austrian succession, diplomatic revolution, and seven years war. And I'll be doing my best to connect these dots as I tell the story. Um, now, as I tell the story, um, I'll also have to incorporate into it uh, the very important empress of Austria at the time, which is, who is Maria Theresa. She's a very important individual that you would need to know. And then uh, a, an important Prussian king, uh, King Frederick II of Prussia, who's remembered as King Frederick the Great. And so for the most part, I'll tell the story like in line. So, you know, like I'll do it one, two, three, four, pragmatic sanction, Austrian succession, diplomatic revolution, and seven years war. And, and so you'll, you have that framework in your head, but also just as I'm doing that, I'll, be, I'll have to talk about Maria Theresa and Frederick II. Okay, so, but there it is now. So know those things, know those things, and be able to connect the dots between those things, and you will be all right understanding your 18th century military and diplomatic history. Okay, so as I tell the story of, uh, uh, of, of the military and, and diplomatic history of the 18th century, uh, let me also highlight right here some of the, the big ideas. So in the previous lecture, I introduced the idea of enlightened monarchy. And what we see here in the 18th century, especially the second half of the 18th century, is uh, there, there's a great deal of success with enlightened monarchy. And what is meant by success is those countries that have an enlightened monarch are more economically and politically stable. And those countries also tend to have more enthusiastic support of their people. Now, this isn't true 100% across the board with all enlightened monarchies. Uh, for example, Joseph II of Austria, we will learn how he was a very enlightened monarch, but also didn't create a whole lot of political stability with his regime. In Russia, there was Catherine II, known as Catherine the Great. She's typically identified as an enlightened monarch. There probably wasn't a whole lot of enthusiasm with her among the people because there was a major peasant uprising against her in the early 1770s. So, I mean, these things aren't perfect, but overwhelmingly with enlightened monarchs, you had societies that were more stable politically, economically, and there tended to be more enthusiasm among the people. Okay. The other big idea, as we continue to talk about this concept of a balance of power, Prussia, so emerges as this extraordinarily powerful state in the center of Europe. And we'll need to learn about how that happens because Prussia, I've mentioned it before, but only because it becomes big in the 18th century. You know, it's been this small little German state, one of the many German states in the Holy Roman Empire. They weren't significant. There's, there was nothing worth mentioning with Prussia within the context, within the greater context of European history, but now they are a major player and they will continue to be a major player throughout the remainder of our story of European history. In other words, they're still, even though it's not Prussia anymore, it's called Germany, <laughs> Prussia is still a major player uh, from the 18th century through to today. All right, so you know, going along with that, we see this major shift in the balance of power. So these are some of the big ideas that I, I just want you to focus in on. And again, I will reiterate them as I come upon them as I discuss the military and diplomatic history of the 18th century. All right, so let's begin with the pragmatic sanction and how it leads to the War of Austrian Succession. All right, Austria, known as the heart of Europe because they are located pretty much in the dead middle of Europe. Its flag is red, white, red. And let's just have fun here. Here's Austria. Maybe some of you are familiar with that old movie from the 60s, The Sound of Music which is, of course, an homage to Austria. Austria, a nice mountainous country, lots of skiing. Ah, uh, Austria. Okay, let's get back to the not as pretty stuff. Okay, Austria. So, you know, where does Austria come from in all this? Well, Austria is pretty much a byproduct of the Thirty Years' War. So the Habsburgs' hometown is Vienna. And we've talked about the Habsburgs before, at least after uh, Charles V splits up his empire between the Spanish possessions and the Central European possessions, the Holy Roman Empire. Um, after all that, the Habsburgs control the Holy Roman Empire, and that's what we think of. They're the emperors of the Holy Roman Empire. We don't think of them as you know, the kings of Austria, but they are. It's just that Austria is one of the many states in the Holy Roman Empire. And then the Thirty Years' War happens. And after the Thirty Years' War, there's just such exhaustion in trying to have any sort of cultural or especially religious 
coherency throughout the empire that after the Thirty Years' War, the Habsburgs pretty much let the Holy Roman, Roman Empire go. And with the Peace of Westphalia, they're like, okay, every, they, they just kind of say, okay, princes, electors, do whatever you want. Do whatever you want. The Habsburgs are still going to remain the emperors of the Holy Roman Empire until the end of the Holy Roman Empire. And the end of the Holy Roman Empire will be 1806 when Napoleon takes it over and he turns it into something else. But the Habsburgs are technically the emperors, but they really don't have much actual authority on what goes, what goes on in the empire. For them, they're emperors in name only. It's sort of an honorary title. But, 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 they still control Austria. They are the kings of Austria. And almost immediately after the Thirty Years' War, they turn eastward. The Ottomans which have controlled southeastern Europe since especially the fall of Constantinople in 1453, the Ottomans are now getting weak. The Ottomans are financially mismanaging their empire, thus giving some of the states they control, like the Hungarians, later on Serbs and Greeks, a chance to rise up and say, we don't want to be part of the Ottoman Empire anymore. We want to go free. Now, when that happens, Austria looks east and says, we can create a new empire spreading eastward. So as you look at this map right here, there's Hungary. And Austria, which has been a longtime enemy of the Ottomans, or rather the Ottomans have been a longtime enemy of the, of, of the Austrians, the Austrians push the Ottomans eastward, and they acquire Hungary. So now Austria has its own empire. And from here on out, we call it the Austrian Empire. Well, we call it the Austrian Empire until the middle of the 19th century, at least. So, But the Austrians have their own empire. So it's separate from the Holy Roman Empire. And Austria is spreading eastward. Also, if you take a look at this map right here, you'll notice that Bohemia, we remember Bohemia, Czech Republic today, um, it is also part of the Austrian Empire empire. And so Austria is doing its own thing. Okay. The, at the dawn of the 18th century, the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire and the emperor of the Austrian Empire is this man, Emperor Charles VI. What do you need to know about Emperor Charles VI, this Habsburg emperor of the Holy Roman Empire and the Austrian Empire? Well, only one thing, really. He has a daughter. He doesn't have a son. His daughter's name is Maria Theresa, and he would like for Maria Theresa to rule the Austrian Empire and the Holy Roman Empire. He wants for the Habsburgs to have their first empress. Okay, and that's pretty much all you need to know about Charles VI. He has no son and a daughter. Okay, and, and when he dies, the daughter takes over. So this shouldn't be any big deal, except there's one problem. And that's this. Maria Theresa is a female. Now females have inherited their dad's thrones before. Mary I, Elizabeth I, uh, both of these in England. There was Queen Isabella in Spain really early on. But what Charles VI knows is going to happen is this. The Habsburgs have such a weak hold on the Holy Roman Empire that the fact that he doesn't have a son take over and we're going to have a non-traditional thing happen, a female take over to become the empress, and we don't have an emperor, there might be another challenge to who can be the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. So in Bavaria, there's the Wittelsbach dynasty, and they have a claim to be to, to the throne of the Holy Roman Empire. So in short, what Charles VI is dealing with is this. Okay, I want my daughter to take over. I want her to be the empress, but I know that as soon as I die and she becomes the, the head of state for Austria and the Holy Roman Empire, it may create this crisis in the empire because all these people are going to say, oh, she's a female. She doesn't have the right to rule. And now it's time for another dynasty to emerge with power and, 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 and to control the Holy Roman Empire. So what Charles VI does to secure the ascension of his daughter, Maria Theresa, to the throne of the Holy Roman Empire is the Pragmatic Sanction of 1713. And what the Pragmatic Sanction of 1713 was, was a whole bunch of bribes. It was very simple. Hey, 
France, hey, Spain, hey, Britain, hey, Prussia, hey, all you major players, I all want you to acknowledge that Maria Theresa is the next empress of the Holy Roman Empire. Acknowledge this and agree to it so that we can have consistency in the Holy Roman Empire. So that's what the pragmatic sanction of 1713 was. Charles VI, Holy Roman Emperor, making all these bribes with France, Spain, Great Britain, Prussia, maybe other people I don't know about. I don't know. It doesn't really matter. It does, gives all these bribes to secure the ascension of his daughter, Maria Theresa, to be the Empress of the Holy Roman Empire. All right. This happens in 1713. That's it. Hopefully that makes sense. Hopefully that's clear. 1740, Charles VI kicks it. He's dead. Do the signers of the Pragmatic Sanction respect the Pragmatic Sanction of 1713 some 30-some years later? No. Within two months of the death of Charles VI, Prussia invades Austria. Specifically, and this is kind of important, they invade a region of Austria called Silesia. Silesia uh, today is mostly Poland. Uh, the reason why Prussia attacked Silesia and took it over was because Silesia has great fertile farming lands. But this act, it was nothing but a brazen land grab. Literally, Prussians said, the, the, the government of Prussia said, and specifically the king that we'll learn about here in a minute, said that Maria Theresa does not have the right to rule, in part because she's a female, and in part because there's somebody else who should be the Holy Roman Emperor, Emperor and they claimed Silesia. It was literally just a land grab. It totally caught... Austria by surprise. For what it's worth, uh, Prussia said that it is the Bavarian uh, uh, king, a uh, guy by the name of Charles Albert. He has, the, he has the right to be the next ruler of the Holy Roman Empire. Prussia had also gotten the support of France because, well, France always hates the Habsburgs. Britain also sort of gets drawn into this conflict because the kings of Britain at this time are the Hanoverian kings. They are originally German from the northern German state of Hanover. And so England has ties to Hanover, which is not friendly with Prussia at this time. They are afraid of Prussian expansion and, and, and more Prussian land grabs. So Prussia, I guess I should mention something about Prussia, where it's located geographically. We'll talk more about Prussia here in a minute. Uh, Prussia and specifically at this point in time, it's Brandenburg, Prussia, is the northern German state of which Berlin is the capital. So it's north of Austria. Okay, so what you see here with these little circles and lines, they represent alliances. And so what you see with the War of Austria's succession is it's becoming a continental war. The War of Austrian succession is going to involve many countries throughout Europe, even though I'm not really going to talk much about the battles that happen between them. Um, it's worth noting, or it's, I don't know if noting is the right word, it's worth mentioning that the War of, of Austrian Succession draws in other conflicts. So Spain and England go to war during this time, and aren't Spain and England always going to, going to war? So there was a side war, <laughs> the side war along with the War of Austrian Succession called the War of Jenkins' Ear. And it's a bizarre story, but it's just fun. It's worth mentioning. So Spain and England, they both have their ports in the Americas. And they both try to maintain monopolies over these ports. And so, you know, if it's a Spanish port, it's not. there aren't supposed to be any English ships going in and out of it to trade, to make money, and then vice versa with the British ports. But uh, down in South America or the Caribbean somewhere, there was a ship commanded by an Admiral Jenkins in, in, from England. It went into a Spanish port, did some trading, left. This, the ship was off the coast of Georgia when a Spanish ship caught up, up to it, Georgia, as in our state, Georgia. And, and, the, and the Spanish ship caught Jenkins' ship. The Spanish boarded Jenkins' ship. They got the Admiral... They accused him of going into the Spanish port, which he did, and then to teach him a lesson, they did something to him, which was actually commonplace as a form of punishment in the 17th century. It's now the early 18th century, though, uh, which is cutting off somebody's ear. So they cut off Jenkins' ear, but they also let Jenkins keep the ear. This ear was then put into a jar with some preservative in it, and it was kept. So that event happened in 1731. In 1739, then, 
that ear made an appearance in Parliament. A member of Parliament who wanted war with Spain got the ear, held it up, and said, this is what the Spanish are doing in the Americas, and Parliament declared war on Spain. And that war was the War of Jenkins' Ear. What does the War of Jenkins' Ear have to do with the War of Spanish Succession? Well, nearly nothing. Nearly nothing, except insofar as Britain has its allies on the continent that are fighting in the War of Austrian Succession, and Spain has its allies that are also fighting in the War of Austrian Succession. So it's getting to be a tangled mess. And that's the problem with balance of power. It's all about these alliances. And this is a problem that we'll see will continue up until the 20th century in World War I. Okay, so, but what you guys need to know for the War of Austrian Succession, the heart of Austrian Succession, the War of Austrian Succession, is the fact that Prussia has just made this land grab against Austria. They've, they've seized Silesia, that fertile region that is mostly part of Poland today. So Maria Theresa, she's an empress. It's the year 1740. And she's not just an empress of the Holy Roman Empire, she's the empress of the Austrian Empire. And the two largest groups that the Austrians control are the Hungarians and the Bohemians, the Czechs. Now here's where we see for the first time the leadership style of Maria Theresa. It is a very interesting leadership style. She is a very unique leader. <laughs> so, okay. When Prussia attacks, not everybody in the Austrian Empire likes Austria. The Bohemians, the Czechs, they've wanted to go free from the Habsburgs for a while. Remember Jan Hus? The Bohemians do not like being controlled by the Habsburgs. And the fact that Austria is now under attack inspires the Bohemian, the Bohemians to start to rise up themselves. Maybe this is their moment. Maybe this is when they can take advantage of the fact that Austria is under attack and they can break off and go free. And then there's the Hungarians. It's important, important to know that the aristocratic class of Hungary are the Magyars. And the Magyars have the reputation for being fierce warriors. And the Hungarians might want to break off and go free themselves. So if you are Maria Theresa, what do you choose to do? Do you just say, oh well, and let Bohemia and Hungary go free? Do you let Prussia keep Silesia? You know, what do you do? How do you handle this particular situation? What move would you make if you're Maria Theresa in the year 1740? Well, here's what she did. Maria Theresa left Vienna to go to the capital of Hungary, the dual city of Buda Pest where she met with the Magyar nobility, and she appealed to their emotions, to their nobility, by proclaiming that she was their queen. She was the empress of the Austrian Empire, and that as their empress, she was to them a mother who would care for them, who would protect them. And as she was making these proclamations, she began to weep, expressing how it was in her nature as a woman and as a mother to care for all of her children. In response to this, in a moment of chivalry, the Magyars held out their swords, saying that they would fight to protect Empress Maria Theresa. The Bohemian Revolt was put down. The forces of the Austrian Empire attempted to repel the Prussians out of Silesia, but they never did. And in 1748, when the war ends, Maria Theresa does not lose either her throne for the Holy Roman Empire or the Austrian Empire. She keeps that, but she does lose the land of Silesia. On the other end, the Prussian king, King Frederick II, remembered as Frederick the Great. We'll learn more about him later. He gets to keep Silesia, but he's now scared the bejeebers out of the rest of Europe because who the heck is Prussia? They're now, they've gone from nobody to this country that does a major land grab against the Habsburgs. So now all eyes turn to Prussia. Who's Prussia? All right, we will return to Frederick II and the story of Prussia here in a few moments. But now let me take a while to dwell on Empress Maria Theresa. Her appeal to the Hungarian nobility, the Magyars, we get a sense of who she is and what her leadership style 
is going to be. So, you know, she's another one of these great female monarchs uh, in European history. You know, she's right up there with Elizabeth I of England or Catherine II of Russia. And, you know, to be a female ruler in the, in the, in the world of men, you have to be incredibly strong in one particular way. You have to really know what your strengths are as a female ruler. And this really comes out in these great female monarchs, and they all come out in very different ways. Um, Elizabeth I had her strengths. Uh, Catherine II, or Catherine the Great of Russia, as we will learn about her later, she had her particular strengths, which were very different from, from, from Elizabeth I of, of England. And then Maria Theresa, she's going to play to her strengths. And so what are her strengths? Well, she's very maternalistic. She's, she's the mom. And she's really going to play this up. I am your mom. I take care of you. I love you. I protect you. There's that element of it. And then remember, she's a Habsburg, so she's a good Catholic. And her Catholic faith really is a guiding force to what type of ruler she's going to be. Now, what's interesting about Maria Theresa is that she's living in the 18th century, which is the era of enlightened monarchy. So let's take a moment just to revisit this idea of an enlightened monarchy. We learned about this previously from how uh, Frederick II, uh, tutored by Voltaire, became an enlightened monarch. We'll also learn about how Catherine II of Russia is frequently considered to be an enlightened monarch. So and an enlightened monarch is a monarch, a king or a queen, or an emperor or an empress, who is inspired by the philosophy of the Enlightenment. The idea that we can use logic, reason, mathematics, science to question the traditions and the practices of the past and to make all of these reforms to improve society and to improve religion and government, etc., based upon these logical criticisms. So an enlightened monarch sort of moves society forward. Uh, there's a sense of progress, and this progress is, is based upon reason. Okay, now, was Maria Theresa, who was going to make all of these reforms to the, to the Austrian Empire, was she, was she an enlightened monarch? Now, some texts say, yes, she was an enlightened monarch because she made all of these incredible progressive reforms to Austria. So some historical texts say, yes, she was. I will make the argument that she was not an enlightened monarch but rather a very good Catholic. Because, and the reason why I'm going to make this argument is because the principal works of the Enlightenment, which are mostly coming out of France at the time, they are banned by Maria Theresa in the Austrian Empire. You are not allowed to own these works in the Austrian Empire. So I don't think that there's much of an argument that she was inspired by the culture of the Enlightenment to make the improvements that she did of the Austrian Empire. So what was her inspiration? Two things, her Catholic faith and the sense of herself as being a mother to her people. And so she makes all of these changes saying, we're going to make our Austria and the Austrian Empire, Hungary, Bohemia, etc. We're going to make our Austrian Empire more Catholic and a place where you feel like you are cared for by your Empress Mother. Now, I think that... Um, you can make a criticism of my theory in this particular way, even though she's reforming society and she's saying that it's her Catholic faith and it's her maternalist, maternalistic instincts to make reforms in this way, the Enlightenment is happening all over Europe at the, in the 18th century. And it's interesting how her interpretation of Catholicism is very different from how... Catholicism had been interpreted in the past in terms of societies that wanted to create a very Catholic society, like, say, for example, Spain in the 16th century with the Spanish Inquisition, killing people who weren't, who, who, who were, who, who weren't Catholic or who were identified as a closet Jew or a closet Muslim or something like that. So they would say, I think a criticism of my argument is, well, yeah, even though she says she's making it more Catholic, isn't it interesting that this her interpretation of Catholicism does seem to be a very enlightened interpretation of Catholicism. And I think that's a fair critique, which is why some historians will say that Empress Maria Theresa was an enlightened monarch. So hopefully I'm not confusing you, giving you multiple perspectives here on Maria Theresa, 
but hopefully you're coming up with a good impression of what she was like as a leader and the culture of Europe at the time. So, okay, on this particular slide, I have a list of reforms that she um, that she made, and I'll go into these in, uh, in some depth here. Okay, Maria Teresa was an actual mom, gave birth to 16 children, 13 of whom survived infancy, two of which will become very important rulers in and of themselves. The first is her son, who becomes the next Austrian empire emperor in the uh, 1780s and early into the 1790s. He was uh, Joseph II. Now, Joseph II was very much an enlightened monarch. He was very influenced by the ideas of the, of, of, of the Enlightenment. And some people say, some historians say, that Joseph II is the best example of an enlightened monarch, better than Frederick II or Catherine II, because Joseph II actively engaged in land reform. He gave peasants more power, opportunities for mobility. He established religious toleration in Austria. Let me say that again. He, at Habsburg, establishes religious toleration in Austria. These were very much reforms that were made that were inspired by the Enlightenment. However, Joseph II is not remembered for being a great monarch because he he simply didn't have the charisma of a strong leader and he really upset a lot of the Austrian nobility because they were losing their power and privileges, specifically their power over the peasants. And so Joseph II remembered as being this great enlightened monarch, and again, this is the 1780s and early 1790s, but ultimately unsuccessful as a monarch because of his poor charisma. Also, because not long after uh, Emperor Joseph II dies, uh, the French Revolution is going on, Napoleon takes over, and most of the reforms that he made were reversed out of, because there was a fear that the French Revolution would spread into Austria. Okay, also, uh, so this is one of the children of Maria Theresa, Joseph II. This is the other one, who is probably a lot more famous. Her youngest daughter was Maria I'm sorry, Marie Antoinette. Marie Antoinette, when she was 15 years old, was shipped off to the Palace of Versailles, where she was introduced to and married the future King of France, Louis XVI. And so Marie Antoinette will be the Queen of France, and she will be the Queen of France when the French Revolution happens. We will learn a lot more about Marie Antoinette later. As for right now, just know that Marie Antoinette is the daughter of Maria Theresa. All right, perhaps one of the most important and longest lasting reforms that Maria Theresa made, or at least in terms of its impact on Austrian culture, was she was a great patron of the arts. So she had an opera house built, and one of her great passions was music. So music takes off in Vienna, and Vienna becomes, for a long period of time, into the 20th century, a center for music. So famously in Austria and Vienna, Austria, here are people waltzing, which was actually considered a revolutionary and naughty form of dancing back in the late 18th century because the men and women were so close to each other. I mean, physically close to each other. So, but this is kind of neat. Vienna becomes the music, cent music center of Europe. And it's interesting. It's sort of like art in Florence. Uh, in the 15th century under the Medici, it seems like once the patrons are there and they start throwing money at a particular form of art, uh, these great, brilliant artists emerge. So, you know, here's the Medici in 15th century Florence and they've put through all this money in, into, into sculpting and painting. And then here comes your Michelangelo's and your Leonardo's and these amazing individuals with this incredible talent. They were able to live producing some of the greatest you know masterpieces in the history of art and something similar then happens in vienna maria Theresa, she has these concert halls built this opera house built the habsburgs are now funding musicians and it was at this time the time of maria Theresa, in the middle of the 18th century in the austrian town of salzburg a boy was born named Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. And Mozart will eventually, well, he travels all over Europe, but he'll eventually end up in Vienna, patronized by Maria Theresa, and then later on, Joseph II. But I mean, it might have just been luck that Mozart was born at that time in that place, that he came from Austria during the reign of, uh, he was born in Austria during the reign of Maria Theresa. But then later on, a generation later, there'll be Beethoven, 
Beethoven, he's born up in Bonn in the German states of the Holy Roman Empire. He knows that if he wants to make it big, there's one city he's got to go to, and that city is Vienna. So Vienna, the music center of Europe. It's interesting to think, do we have a music center in the world today? If so, you, I would guess it might be in the United States. Is it New York? Is it LA? Is it Nashville? Maybe it's London. My senior year of uh, high school in the early 1990s, Seattle, Washington was the hot spot because of all the grunge music that was coming out of Seattle. It's in interesting to think about why particular places and a particular time in history become the hot spot for the arts. But in the middle of the 18th century, it's clear Maria Theresa threw money into the arts. Okay, now here's a good musician to know if ever you have to write about the arts in the 18th century. Because the 18th century is a time of progress, a, a sense that things are getting better. Joseph Haydn, or if you want to anglicize his name, Joseph Haydn. He was an Austrian musician, goes to Vienna, and he wants to take advantage of these new concert halls. So Maria Theresa, she would, you know, she thought of herself as a mom. She wanted to take care of her people. So when it comes to music, you know, previously, if you wanted to hear music, it would likely be at a party or an event, and musicians would be hired to come and perform. This would be probably something slightly similar to having musicians come and sit in your living room, and you would have what we call chamber music. And these performances would be for a relatively small crowd. Now, once you have auditoriums, like Maria Theresa's having built in Vienna, you can't have, you know, four or five musicians sitting around. You're going to need a bunch of, of musicians to create a musical sonic boom to fill up these concert halls. And here's where Joseph Haydn enters the scene. This is the individual who says, or who comes up with a plan for getting a whole bunch of musicians together, organizing them in such a way that the instruments blend and the music that they collectively produce makes sense and sounds good, Haydn helps to develop the symphony orchestra. And then, once you've got this big band put together, you're going to have to create new musical compositions for this new huge symphony orchestra. And so Haydn's symphony orchestra is a great example of the Enlightenment, of how things are progressing, things are, seem to be getting better. Haydn's music itself was very happy and upbeat, very kind of had an optimistic feel to it. Haydn's career will overlap in the late 18th century with Mozart's, whose music is also uh, very upbeat for the most part. I'm, I'm very much oversimplifying both Mozart and, and Haydn. At, it's not like everything they wrote was happy and upbeat, and both guys were very revolutionary in their own ways. But hopefully overall you can see how the symphony orchestra was very much emblematic of the 18th century. All right, other stuff that Maria Theresa is doing. Hospitals. Hospitals for everybody, not just the rich, but for peasants as well. To use some 21st century terminology to describe what Maria Theresa is doing, she's expanding health care to all. She also expands education, not to all, but to more people. So, for example, she has constructed the Viennese Medical School. This is just one example of one of the schools that she had built. Um, when I was in Prague in 2014, I did hear the story of how she had constructed a school for children in poverty. But was, what was really interesting is um, it was only for a limited number of kids. It's not like all kids had access to education. And I don't know exactly how many kids could go to this particular school. And I also don't know how the kids were chosen. Of all the kids that were in poverty, I don't know how those kids got access to that school. So it's not like she's providing universal education like what you guys get. But she is, in fact, expanding education so that more people have access to it. All right. One last thing I don't have a slide for here. Maria Theresa abolished torture in the Austrian Empire. She made torture illegal. She also abolished capital punishment. She got rid of the death penalty. So in that particular way, one can make the argument that Austria in the 18th century under Maria Theresa was more progressive than the United States of America in the 21st century, or at least early 21st century, uh, since we have not abolished the death penalty. So that was Maria Theresa, and those were the reforms that she made to Austria. She's a very interesting leader. Now, here's one thing that she did that does not reflect enlightened reforms, or enlightened reform. Maria Theresa wanted to 
banish all of the Jews out of the Austrian Empire. And there was a significant minority of Jews that lived in the Austrian Empire. She attempted to banish them, literally kick out all Jews. You're not allowed in the Austrian Empire. She was talked out of making this decision after advisors told her that the Jews played an important role as merchants and bankers within her empire. And she was reminded how in the year 1685, when Louis XIV banished all the Huguenots out of France, that this was bad for the economy as a whole. So she refrained from following through with that. But it's worth noting just how incredibly anti-Semitic she was. She was a good, kind, loving Catholic, but she was intolerant of other religions. Another interesting thing that, uh, that Maria Theresa did in terms of her reform was this. In Austria in the 18th century, it was a common custom among female aristocracy to have two male lovers. So you had your husband to whom you were married and that marriage was arranged. And then it was common practice in most places in Europe for the man to have a mistress on the side. Well, in Austria, it was common practice for a woman to have a, another man on the side. <laughs> I do not know what the male equivalent of mistress is. <laughs> a mister, I don't know. But in other words, for female aristocracy in Austria, you had two guys, your husband and uh, your boyfriend your mister. Well, Maria Theresa thought that this, this was a very, very unchristian practice for women to be doing this. So any woman, any female aristocrat who was found financing another a home for another man, so the home in which she kind of keeps her boyfriend, and that could be its own separate residence, or it could simply be a, a room within her own home, any woman caught doing this would have her head shaved. And there literally was a police force called the chastity police that would come find the woman and shave her head, thus humiliating and shaming her for several years as she waited for her hair to grow back out. <laughs> if you're interested in this fun little part of European history, uh, we know a lot about the women in Austria who had two men by an English traveler. Her name was Lady Montague. Lady Montague from England. Um, she traveled uh, throughout the continent with her husband and she kept this diary in the 18th century. And so we know a lot about the customs, uh, especially of the aristocracy in various places throughout, throughout Europe in the 18th century from the writings of this Lady Montague. And she wrote about the women in Austria that, that would show up to these galas and they would literally have their husband on one side and their boyfriend or their mister on the other side as they sat at a table and had dinner. There was no shame in this at all. It was very much common practice. So it was two boys for every girl in Austria. All right, like nearly every monarch in Europe in the 18th century, Maria Theresa wants to copy Louis XIV, the Sun King. So she builds her own huge palace with gardens in downtown Vienna. And this is Schönbrunn Palace. Schönbrunn Palace, there it is. I visited Schönbrunn Palace once when I was 19. I remember nothing of Schönbrunn Palace, but hey, there it is. It doesn't look pretty. There are the gardens. Hey, and for what it's worth, at this point in time in history, the late 18th century, Ohio is getting settled by Americans. And one of the very first settlements in Ohio, which was across the border from Pennsylvania in northeastern Ohio, one of the very first American settlements was called Schönbrunn Village, named after Schönbrunn Palace. Why they named it after Schönbrunn Palace, I have no clue. All right. But, Apiro Bears, that's all that I have to say about Maria Theresa. So now let me move north to talk about her nemesis, Old Fritz, Friedrich der Grosse, King Frederick II of Prussia, Frederick the Great. All right, so before I can talk about Frederick the Great, I have to give us a little bit of historical background here. We have to go back to Prussia and talk about what Prussia was. So Prussia has always existed it's been a state within the Holy Roman Empire. It's located up north on the, Balt on the coast of the Baltic Sea, bordering modern-day Lithuania, across the Baltic Sea from Finland and Switzerland. During the Thirty Years' War, Prussia merged with Brandenburg, and those two separate states became a singular state, the state of Brandenburg, Prussia. And it was, in fact, called Brandenburg, Prussia until the time of Frederick the Great when he took over in 1740. And this map that you see here is what Frederick inherited. And this is 
really an annoying country to look at because it's not consistent. Prussia and Brandenburg aren't even united. You've got all these other island possessions out in the Holy Roman Empire. It's not one geographically coherent state. This makes it different from like, you know, you think of like Spain or France. These countries have a particular shape, right? And you don't have that with Brandenburg, Prussia, which makes it a bit of a mess on a map. But this helps us understand the history of Brandenburg, Prussia, and why Brandenburg, Prussia, and Prussia after 1740, why it develops the culture that it does. So let's take it back to the Thirty Years' War. You remember what happens to the German states in the Thirty Years' War. Germany, or the German states, the Holy Roman Empire, becomes this international playground of war. Wallenstein and Tilly are rampaging with their armies from the south. You got Gustavus Adolphus with his armies coming down from the north. You got the Spanish getting involved. You got the French getting involved. And all of these armies are converging upon the German speaking people of Central Europe. And the German speaking people of Europe in the Holy Roman Empire, they're going through hell. A third of them die. So when it's all over with the Peace of Westphalia in 1648, First of all, it's going to take the German-speaking people a half a century, 50 years, to recover their population. And then, in various different ways, these German states never, ever, ever want this to happen ever again. So the local governments try start trying to think of a way to protect themselves. So Brandenburg, Prussia, these two states which had combined during the Thirty Years' War, they feel particularly vulnerable because... They are not one coherent country geographically, and there are no natural boundaries. There are no major rivers to separate them from neighboring states. There are no large mountain ranges. Really, the only natural boundary that they have is the Baltic Sea to the north. So this makes them feel vulnerable. You can contrast this with being an American citizen, because here in the United States, we've got two big oceans as our borders. Those oceans throughout our history have made us feel very secure. So when there's civil war going on in China or there are world wars breaking out in Europe in the 20th century, you know, we feel like, okay, that's far, far away from us. We are okay. It's a real sense of security having two oceans on either side of our country. But for Brandenburg, Prussia, having recovered from the ravages of the Thirty Years' War, they don't feel any sort of security and they know that at any point in time they can be invaded. So how do you think the government of Brandenburg, Prussia responded? If you were a king of Brandenburg, Prussia, how would you protect your realm? And if you think to yourself, well, in order to protect our land, since there's no natural geographical, physical boundary to protect us, well, then we're going to have to protect ourselves, which means we're going to have to develop a very strong and powerful army. If you think that, you'd be right on in terms of what the kings of Brandenburg, Prussia did. So they established mandatory military service for all young men in Brandenburg, Prussia. So that by the time we get to the 18th century, we have a phrase that we can attach to Prussia, after Brandenburg, Prussia gets shortened to just Prussia. We have a particular phrase, which is fairly easy to remember, and many students in the past tend to remember this phrase for Prussia and how we can describe it, which is this. Prussia was not a country with an army, but rather an army with a country. And now's a good time for me to introduce this particular term to you. So if you don't speak German or if you're unfamiliar with the German language, the letter J is pronounced like our Ys. So this word is not pronounced Junker, it's pronounced Junker. And a Junker is a Prussian aristocrat. A Junker is a Prussian aristocrat. So as we're learning about all the aristocratic titles throughout European history, uh, in, in, down in Hungary, the Hungarian aristocrats are the Magyars over in Russia. The Russian aristocrats are the Boyars. And in Prussia, they are the Junkers. And if you do speak a little German, Junker uh, comes uh, from the Middle Ages and the German word for uh, young sir or jung Herr. And it's sort of a twist on that and you get Junker. Okay. So after the Thirty Years' War, this aristocratic class of Brandenburg and Prussia proudly takes on the duty of becoming military commanders. So throughout the rest of Prussian and then eventually German history, 
into the 20th century, this Junker class of Prussian aristocrats will be associated with German military commanders or Prussian military commanders at this point in time. These Junkers, these aristocrats, had tended to have these very, very, very large estates. And then as the 18th century progresses, and then well into the 19th uh, century, the Junkers have greater control over their peasants. Okay, so Junkers, those are Prussian aristocrats. They tend to be associated with military commanders, and first the Prussian army, and then when Prussia becomes Germany, the German military. And they also had a great deal of control over their peasants. Okay, Junker, an important term to know. So the very first king or ruler of the uh, region of Brandenburg, Prussia, following the Thirty Years' War in the late 17th century that we need to know about is the Great Elector. There's not much we need to know about the Great Elector, but this does help us set up the family of Frederick the Great. So the Great Elector, his name was Frederick William. He is of the Hohenzollern dynasty. And it's important to remember Hohenzollern dynasty, the ruling family of Prussia, which, which they go on to become the ruling emperors of Germany after Germany forms in the year 1871, the Hohenzollern family. And so this is the first guy that we need to know about from, uh, from the Hohenzollern family, the great elector. So that term elector you're familiar with, one of the electors of the Holy Roman Empire. And what makes him great is how he treated his people. His hometown is Berlin. In Berlin, he establishes a university. In Berlin, he establishes a library. And in Berlin, he provided religious toleration to Catholics and Protestants. And if you remember, it's this man, the great elector, who invited the Huguenot refugees who were now illegal in France after 1685 and the, and the Edict of Fontainebleau. He invited them to come live in Berlin. The great elector himself was Calvinist. He did, however, switch his religion to Lutheran. Following the death of the great elector, there were two more Hohenzollern monarchs that ruled over Brandenburg, Prussia, before we have the arrival of Frederick II. And I apologize, I'm not being too specific with dates here. We're talking about uh, the late 17th century into the early 18th century. The great elector ruled Brandenburg, Prussia in the years after the Thirty Years' War and into the end of the 17th century. Frederick II will take the throne in the year 1740, which is the pivotal year when the War of Austrian Succession starts. The two guys in between are King Frederick I and King Frederick William I. It's kind of annoying when we talk about the history of Prussia, everybody is either a King Frederick or a King Frederick William. They are pretty hard to keep straight. For the era of the 18th century, though, the one you need to know is Frederick II, who is also Frederick the Great. And if it helps you just to call him Frederick the Great, then that's fine. You can just call him Frederick the Great. And there's not much we need to know about King Frederick I or King Frederick William I, except how they influence King Frederick II. So Frederick I, the first monarch after the Great Elector, he was very much a patron of the arts. And his son, King Frederick William I, who was remembered as the soldier king, was the exact opposite. The soldier king, Frederick William I, had very little interest in the arts, but had a great deal of interest in developing the Prussian military. So Frederick William I, the soldier king, the first thing he did was get rid of a lot of his dad's elaborate courtiers. So his dad had built up this palace that was filled with a lot of entertainment, there were elaborate dinners. There were many people that worked in the court. And Frederick William I, the soldier king, in a soldier-like fa fashion, he got rid of a lot of this, and he took that money and he put it towards the military. He believed very much in military development. He wasn't really an enlightened ruler. Uh, he didn't really believe in intellectualism. So he also didn't give that much money to university-level edu ed education. What's interesting is that he also... Uh, he, he actually created a whole bunch of elementary schools, thousands of elementary schools around the Brandenburg, Prussia area. But he loved the military and he really wanted to develop the military. So the soldier king oversaw the training regiment for the soldiers of Brandenburg, Prussia. He wanted to make sure that his soldiers were the toughest. So there was harsh discipline and a strict regiment in all of the military academies in Brandenburg, Prussia. And for what it's worth, the soldier king, Frederick William I, also had a fascination with tall soldiers. He wanted, wanted all of his soldiers to be at least six foot tall. 
And you sort of get that impression from this particular image of the soldier king looking up at all of his tall soldiers in the Prussian military. Okay, so this gives you a sense of what the soldier king is like. Now, for all of his building up of a strong military, he also didn't really use it. Prussia was not an aggressive state at this point in time, but they were a state that had developed a, that had developed a very well-disciplined and large army. And this would be the army that Frederick II would inherit. Now, it seems to be an interesting thing in the Hohenzollern family that fathers and sons don't seem to get along very well. Frederick I, he loved the arts, he loved the court, he was very frivolous in his lifestyle, and then along comes his son, the soldier king, and he wants discipline and manliness and a strong military and not a lot of money given to the court, but money given to the military. He wants strong military discipline. And go figure then, his son, who's Prince Frederick, the future Frederick II, has no interest in the military. Prince Frederick's interests are instead Latin and French poetry, playing the flute, and writing love letters to girls in England. Prince Frederick has no interest in military, in, in, anything, in anything related to the military. And so his father responds to this by having his son beaten thinking that he could literally whip his son into shape. Beating him will toughen him up. Now, if you think, well, that would never work, you'd be right. It makes Pre Prince Frederick hate the military even more, hate his dad even more, and he really starts considering running away. I'm sure that the soldier king was even more annoyed when he found out that his son's love interest wasn't, in fact, a female, but a male. Frederick II, by all accounts, was in love with a man by the name of Hans Hermann von Katte, a young aristocratic man who was in the Prussian military. And when Prince Frederick was 18 years old and he was sick and tired of his abusive dad and dealing with this psychodrama with his dad about how he needed to toughen up, develop more manly interests besides poetry and music, and prepare himself to be a military commander, Frederick, Prince Frederick, he decides to run away. So he and Hans Hermann von Katte, they developed a scheme to run away. They were going to try to hightail it to England. Now, planning such an escape would take the cooperation of a few other soldiers, guards, that would protect the carriage to get him across the countryside, to get him onto the boat to sail him to England. And for the guards, who likely would have gone to England with them, this was simply too perilous of a thing to do. Because, I mean, think of it. If, you're, if you get caught sneaking out the prince and his lover out, trying to, out to England, you're going to get executed. So for the guards, or at least for at least one of the guards, it was in their best interest to turn him in. So the carriage doesn't make it very far. Hans Hermann von Katte, Prince Frederick, they're busted. This happens in the year 1730, 10 years before Frederick becomes king. The soldier king is livid, he's furious, and he wants to do something to completely break his son's spirit and force him to toughen up. And so here's what the soldier king decides to have done. He's going to force his son to watch his lover's execution. So Von Kata is going to get his head chopped off with a broadsword. That's how they did it in Prussia. We'll learn about two executions that happen in Prussia like this. The first is Von Kata. And if you look at the screen here, you can see the broadsword that's being held. You've got Von Kata on his knees kneeling down. He's looking up to Frederick in this picture. And the executioner has the sword, the broadsword that's going to be used to chop off the head. This is no big heavy axe, so I assume it'll take several swipes to actually cut off the head. It's certainly not as pleasant as the way they did things in England. So Von Kata is going to die. Frederick II, who's, I keep jumping ahead and calling him Frederick II. He's still Prince Frederick at this time. His guards held his head out the window, which you don't really see in this particular image here. They forced him to watch this. He was so upset that he kept screaming out to Von Kata, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me. He also was screaming this in French because these two young men preferred to speak French, which is the language of the Enlightenment, to their native German. So Frederick II was screaming, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me. And uh, Hans Hermann Von Kata was, was yelling back, I would do this for you a thousand times, my prince. And Frederick, Prince Frederick, is forced to watch his lover's head get chopped off. And when that happens, 
something inside Prince Frederick just breaks. He turns into a very different type of person. It's one of, this is one of those moments in history where it's worth putting yourself in the shoes of an individual from the past. So imagine you're Prince Frederick. You're in love with somebody. You hate your family. You're 18 years old. You try to run away to spend the rest of your life in exile with the person that you love. You're caught and you're forced to watch this person die. How would you respond? I mean, everybody in life deals with heartache, and to some extent, but this is heartache of a different sort. Prince Frederick had to have felt extraordinarily trapped. And then heartbreak doesn't even begin to describe this. This is heartbreak combined with this awful traumatic experience. So it's worth thinking about how you might guess how you would respond in this particular situation. We'll see how Frederick responds. His dad immediately arranges a marriage for Frederick with a woman with an incredibly long name. You don't get any more German than this. <laughs> Elizabeth Christina von Brunswick Wolfenbüttel Bevern. I think I said all that slightly right. Go figure this marriage is not going to last and they are going to produce zero children. Her life won't be that bad though. We'll, we'll learn more about her in a second. So what happens to Frederick II? How does he respond to this awful experience? Well, here's what happens to him. When it comes to love and intimacy, Frederick shuts down. He will not be intimate with another human being for the rest of his life. And then, amazingly, he decides that he is going to study how to become a great military commander. So he reads the works of Julius Caesar. He reads about Alexander the Great. He reads about Gustavus Adolphus. He studies the great military commanders. He's become almost robotic that he will also become one of these great military commanders. He will be the ultimate Prussian king. His old identity, his old sense of self starts to get buried underneath this sense of duty to what he has to be, the king of Prussia. So there's, there's this very famous quote. Well, it's not very famous, but it's this quote that Frederick's biographers have picked up on. And it gives us an insight into the psychological transformation of Frederick and what he becomes when he becomes the king of Prussia. And Frederick said, I am the mirror that dare not reveal what made it, but instead reflects what is around it. So this is the new Frederick. He's a mirror. You look at him and you see all around him, or you see in him, Prussia. He is going to reflect Prussia, the country that doesn't have an army, but the army that has a, the country, Prussia. And he says in so many words, I dare not reveal what made me. So his original interest of the art, poetry, his love for von Kata, all of that he buries. And he focuses on just simply preparing himself to be the king of Prussia and a military commander. So for many people, the story of Frederick is a sad, sort, a sad story. And it, he was only in his late teens, barely a man, when he had to face the harsh reality of, I can't be who I want to be, I have to be somebody else. And after that traumatic experience, he embraces it. Now those qualities of himself, his love for the arts, that caring, compassionate side of Frederick, it is still there and it will come out in different ways. And it's these qualities that make Frederick a very interesting king. So let's talk about him becoming a king. 1740 is the year. 1740 is an important year in European history because Maria Theresa ascends to the throne in Austria. Frederick will ascend to the throne in Prussia. And it is, of course, the first year of, this, of, the, war of Austrian, uh, the War of Austrian Succession. All right, so 1740, dad dies. First thing that Frederick does, divorces his wife. Bye-bye, Elizabeth. It's kind of sad, Frederick never loved you, but hey, check out that house there. You get to live there forever, and the state of Prussia will take care of you. But you're divorced, bye-bye. Next, the goal is to turn Prussia into a powerful state in Europe. So, Frederick invades Silesia. Why does he invade Silesia? And you can see Silesia here on this map. Again, I've said this before, <laughs> it's part of Poland today. It was part of the Austrian Empire back then. Why does Prussia invade it? Well, it's good fertile land for farming. 
But the Austrian Empire had done absolutely nothing to provoke Prussia. This was simply a very aggressive land grab. But it, starts, it, it sparks the Seven-Year War of Austrian succession, and Frederick gets to keep it, and Prussia is now a powerhouse. His military, the Prussian army, his dad built it up. His dad was the soldier king, but Frederick's still going to be the one who actually uses it. At this point in time in history, the armies that win battles are the armies that don't cower under gunfire. So in the Prussian military schools, you were drilled and you were drilled and you were drilled. There was a lot of harsh discipline. The goal of that harsh discipline was to toughen you up as a soldier emotionally to the horrors of battle. Because the armies that win battles in the 18th century are the armies of foot, foot soldiers that don't shrink under fire, that don't fall back under fire. So this means that each individual soldier must be tough, tough in that they can literally walk face first into musket fire, and that the units as a whole are very well organized. So thinking about that, take a look at this particular image of the Prussian army in the 18th century. So let's take a look at what you see here. You have a very large, formidable force. I mean, you see this line of men that looks like it's about three deep. It looks like it's three rows deep, and this line of men goes on to quite some distance, and they are all marching forward into musket fire. Now, muskets in the 18th century are not that accurate. We don't have rifled barrels on guns yet that'll shoot a bullet with far more accuracy. So the musket balls sort of waffle around in the air a little bit. So most musket fire will miss its mark, especially at a considerable distance, like a couple hundred yards. But the armies that win battle battles are going to be the armies that don't relent. So what you see here is this. These are professional soldiers. These are soldiers that are in the army for life. They are trained, they are disciplined. And you see them here advancing towards the enemy and they are under enemy fire. Now, if you look a little bit more closely at the image, especially on the right hand side of the image, you see one man and he's getting hit and he's falling back. And then the man to our left, his right, is looking at him. He's looking at him fall, and everybody around him is starting, especially the people behind him, are starting to adjust themselves because they're going to have to step over this guy as he falls, but they are all continually marching forward until they are close enough that they can engage the enemy. This would be a very difficult army to fight if you had a kingdom where you didn't have professional soldiers and the time had come for war and as a king, you had to summon the aristocrats to round up some commoners to fight for you the Prussians had a very well-disciplined professional army. And of course, this is all the long-term consequences of the Thirty Years' War. Frederick II, Frederick the Great, as a commander, was known for being, to a certain extent, chummy with his men. He refused to dress in a flamboyant uniform. His uniform itself was rather humble. And at night, when his men made camp in the field, he would actually go around and speak to his men. He was one of them. And so he earned this nickname that nobody would call him to his face, but the men referred to him as this behind his back in camp as Old Fritz. It was sort of a chummy, friendly nickname. If you go to the German Military Museum in Berlin today, which is this building here, and you go into it, you can actually see Frederick II's not too terribly flashy uniform as the king of Prussia. So at the end of the war of Austrian succession, Prussia and Brandenburg is now seen to be a threat to the rest of Europe. He has upset the balance of power. He has seized Silesia. He has defeated the Habsburgs. So as we enter into the middle of the 18th century, we now have a new state. And England and France and Spain and Russia all look to the center of Europe Prussia. They're a young power, but they're still a power, and they seem to be growing, and oh my goodness, what a military machine they have. Who can stop them? And who is this king, Frederick II? He's a very different type of king. First of all, he builds a very different type of palace. Most monarchs in the 18th century were attempting to copy Versailles, like Schönbrunn Palace in Vienna, like the Winter Palace up in St. Petersburg, Russia, Frederick the Great does something similar, but he makes it his own thing. 
So Frederick the Great builds his palace, not in the capital city of Berlin, but a few miles outside of Berlin, in the, so in the Berlin suburb of Potsdam. So this seems to be a little bit like Louis XIV building his palace not in Paris, but outside of Paris and Versailles. Reflecting the culture of the era, he names his palace Sans Souci. He gives it a French name, not a German name, Sans Souci, which means without worry. As if, this is where I go to get away from it all. This is the place where I can be without worries. And it's similar to Versailles in that you have the central palace like you see here. And then there are other buildings around the central palace where nobility can come and stay with them. So just like Louis XIV, Frederick will keep the nobility within arm's reach so he can know what they're doing, so he can talk to them. He does not set up a court system like Louis XIV does. That is not in the personality of Frederick the Great at all. But he does want to have them around. Also, for what it's worth, women are not present in the court of Frederick II. Frederick's court was all men. And in nearly every other court throughout Europe, there were women that were present. But if you go back in time to the 18th century and go to the Frederick the Great's court at Sans Souci, you probably would not see women. Now, what you would see at the court at Sans Souci would be dogs. <laughs> Frederick the Great loved his dogs. He never again marries, he never again has a queen, he doesn't have any lovers, but he enjoys the company of dogs. And I believe the type of dogs that he liked were greyhounds. So man's best friend, Frederick thought, the same, thought that way about his dogs. He really was a very lonely man, it seems like, and he spent a lot of time alone. So he at least had his pets to keep him company. Okay, let me actually talk about the grounds of Sans Souci. So look at your screen and check it out. You'll notice that it is very, very humble as a palace. It's not, you know, three stories high like Versailles. It's this simple, like, one-story stretch of a palace. And then you'll notice that there are these tiered gardens and a staircase leading up to it. And this is actually the backside of Versailles that you're looking at. It's probably the most famous image of Versailles. Uh, the front side, there's sort of a drive that goes up to it. It's, it's not as visually appealing to look at. So the, the, the back of it uh, ten, tends to be what you see in photographs. It's a lot nicer. But um, let me talk a little bit about those tiered gardens that you see. I'm gonna zoom in on it a little bit. And as you see those tiered gardens leading up to Sans Souci, you see that there are doors that open up into greenhouses. So let me talk a little bit about these greenhouses that are here. Frederick the Great had two favorite drinks. One was coffee and the other was orange juice. He loved orange juice and he loved fresh squeezed orange juice every morning. And if you're the king, you think, well, okay, I can get fresh squeezed orange juice every morning and it should be a relatively simply thing to order up. But he lives in, you know, outside of Berlin. Oranges don't grow in Northern Germany. Oranges need a much more warmer climate. I mean, you think here in the United States, we grow our oranges in Florida. And not really f any further north than Florida. But Frederick said, I want oranges. So this is the back of Sans Souci. Sans Souci faces south, or this backside is facing south. So these greenhouses will catch the arc of the sun all year long. And inside of them, you could grow orange trees. Just enough heat would have been captured in these greenhouses so that oranges could grow on the orange tree and that every morning Frederick the Great could have his oranges. Here's another image of the backside of Sans Souci. You see the tiered gardens and here's a more up close look at these greenhouses. And here is one goofy American tourist admiring the, <laughs> the greenhouse. And I was so disappointed when I went there and there weren't actually orange trees still in there or at least None that I saw as I strolled the grounds. Sans Souci. There's just the emblazoned name of it. An interesting structure on the grounds of Sans Souci. A Chinese tea house. This is a nice little reflection of the Enlightenment. How in Germany they are interested in other cultures. So Frederick had built a Chinese tea house. 
Now, I'm going to zoom in a little closer to it, and in this picture, you see a couple things. First of all, the other tourists that are there, that's my friend who actually used to teach AP European history at Thomas Worthington and his son. But if you look uh, at the actual sculptures, the sculptures of the Chinese people actually look very European. They don't actually look Chinese. But it's at least in the 18th century a better attempt to understand another culture. At Sans Souci, there would also be concerts, musical concerts. Frederick loved playing the flute. In fact, one of my German friends said when I asked her, hey, do you remember learning about uh, uh, Frederick the Great growing up? He grew up in Germany uh, in the latter half of the 20th century. Like, you know, is Frederick the Great still taught as part of the history curriculum? And her response was, yes, kids grow up knowing that Frederick the Great played the flute probably like how American kids grow up learning about how uh, George Washington chopped down a cherry tree, even though that actually never happened. It's like the story that a kid will associate with this historical figure. So Frederick the Great played the flute. And Frederick the Great actually did play the flute. And more than that, Frederick the Great composed music for the flute. In fact, it's actually considered to be extraordinarily high quality music, so that even if he had never become a monarch, he could be remembered today as one of the greatest musicians of the 18th century. There's a documentary on Frederick the Great. It is called Frederick the Great and the Enigma of Prussia. If you're interested in the story of Frederick the Great, it's a, it's a superb documentary. In this particular documentary, they interview musicians, musicians who studied the music of Frederick and their commentary on the, on the compositions of Frederick the Great are amazing. They said, first of all, technically, this is very difficult stuff to play. Frederick II had composed these concertos for the flute. That means it would be a flute, com uh, it would be music written for you know, both a flute who would be in the lead and then a background uh, chamber orchestra. He, would co he composed these concertos and they were difficult to play. They were challenging pieces of music, which is, of course, testimony to his ability. But then, at least according to these musicians, they talked about what the music itself is like. And they talk about how it's aching. It's dark and depressing and aching. And a lot of people's interpretation of this is, well, this is because Frederick II had sublimated so many emotions after the trauma that he experienced in his late teens that of course the music that he composes is going to be dark and aching. But here you have a particular image of Frederick playing one of his pieces, a concerto for the flute. And as I'm looking at these images, there are women in this particular image. The greatest musician at the time in Prussia, in the Prussia of Frederick the Great, was this man, Johann Sebastian Bach. So just like how I talked about uh, Mozart, uh, being around during the time of the elderly Maria Theresa and Joseph II of Austria. He's one of the most important uh, um, musicians of the 18th century. And a generation earlier, there was Johann Sebastian Bach up in Prussia. Um, Bach. So Bach is about a generation younger than, um, or a generation older than Mozart. So he was around before Mozart. Uh, so far as I know, Bach did not spend too much time in Vienna. This is sort of before the rise of Vienna as a, as a the music center of Europe. Johann Sebastian Bach was a church organist. He is associated with the Baroque movement in music history. So we learned about Baroque artwork. There was Baroque music as well. And Bach is probably the best example of Baroque music. And Bach met Frederick the Great. And at least according to legend, the two guys jammed together. Frederick on the flute and Bach on the harpsichord, I believe. So if you need another example of the, an expression of the Enlightenment, Bach is an excellent example. And here's why. When we think of the Enlightenment, we think of progress. We think of an increased understanding of math and science. And there's something very mathematical about Bach's music. That's not to say it was devoid of emotion, not at all, but it is very complex music. Okay, so think of Baroque architecture. Baroque architecture is very, very complex. Think of like a Baroque cathedral. You walk into it and it's filled with all of these elaborate and incredibly detailed swirling images. 
it's dizzying when you walk into a Baroque cathedral. Now, Bach's, art, Bach's music is similar in that way. Bach was a master at something called counterpoint in music. Now, I'm not a great musicologist, so I'm gonna give you a very sort of general description of what counterpoint is, and hopefully it'll give you a feel for the type of complex music that Bach was trying to create. Okay, so think of counterpoint like this. Think of a melody. All right, a melody is a song without chords, like Twinkle Twinkle Little Star is a melody. An easy way, I think, to understand counterpoint is imagine two melodies layered on top of each other. So you pretty much have two songs going on at the same time, but each note of each song is in harmony with the other melody. So to say that again, each note of one melody is in harmony with the note of the other melody, even though the two melodies are different. So there's something mathematic about this because you have to understand which notes sound well together, and then you work on creating a song with two different melodies that sound beautiful in and of themselves, and then when played together are even more incredible each melody enhances the other. So that's counterpoint. And that, I hope that is, first of all, if a, somebody who knows music really well, if they heard this description of it, I hope it works. This is at least what I hear when I hear Bach. I think if you grow up playing the piano today, Bach seems to be standard fare. It's good to learn how to play Bach because if you can teach your hands how to do this, it sort of opens up a wide variety of music that you can play. It's great to learn how to play Bach as you're learning how to play the piano. And if Bach is, of course, a great example of the Enlightenment, then so is Voltaire. You guys already have heard this story about how Frederick invited Voltaire to come and live with him at Sans Souci and to educate him and to help consult him in terms of how he could be a great enlightened monarch. An excellent example of enlightened monarchy is Frederick the Great's book, The Anti-Machiavel, in which Frederick refutes the ideas of Machiavelli and what Machiavelli wrote in The Prince and instead suggests that the greatest leader will be one who cares for his people, who loves his people, who provides for his people, that the people will support that monarch. Another fantastic example, and for me this is my favorite example, of the enlightened monarchy of Frederick, it's this particular structure, St. Hedwig's Cathedral in Berlin. So up in the Prussian state, earlier when it was Brandenburg, Prussia, under uh, the rule of the great elector, you might remember that the great elector provided religious freedom for his people. So he himself was a Calvinist who became Lutheran, but he legalized Catholicism, Lutheranism, and Catholicism in the state of Brandenburg, Prussia. Also, at some point in time during the story of Brandenburg, Prussia, before Frederick the Great, um, Jews are allowed to live in Brandenburg, Prussia as well. Although Frederick had weird ideas about the Jews, he didn't think that they could be assimilated into the culture, and so he preferred if they lived on the frontier of Brandenburg, Prussia in their own cities. So they're not completely assimilated, but they are allowed to live within Brandenburg, Prussia, or rather Prussia during the time of uh, Frederick the Great. Okay, so back to St. Hedwig's Cathedral. This is a cathedral, so it's a Catholic church that Frederick has built after the invasion of Silesia. So Frederick, to show that he respects all religions, or at least all Christian religions, he has built in downtown Berlin, St. Hedwig's Cathedral. Now, let's take a look at St. Hedwig's Cathedral here. If you're looking at the facade of it and say, well, the facade of it with its columns and its relief on the crown, that looks very 18th century, but that dome on top of it does not look like something that was built in the 18th century. Well, you'd be right. Uh, there was an original dome that was built on top of St. Hedwig's that was blown up during World War II during the many Allied bombings of Berlin in the 1940s, specifically in, in, the, in the winter and spring of 45. So what you see there is uh, the the reconstruction of the dome on St. Hedwig's 
uh, as it was built at some point in time in the late 20th century. And it's built today, well, where it's situated today is right in the heart of so much in the middle of Berlin. It's not that far away from the Brandenburg Gate. It's located right next to the Paris, or I'm sorry, not the Paris Opera House, the Berlin Opera House. In fact, whoever took this picture here, all they would have to do is turn to the right and they'd be looking directly at the Berlin Opera House. Uh, Still imagining a, a, you're the photographer taking this picture. Right behind you would be the main road that goes through downtown Berlin, which is called the Unter den Lindenstrasse, or <laughs> it's a long name, Under the Linden Trees Street, Unter den Lindenstrasse, um, a very famous road that goes up to the Brandenburg Gate. And then behind uh, or on the other side of the street would be uh, Humboldt University, which is a very famous university established in the early 19th century that I'll probably talk about when we get when we get to the early 19th century too. Okay, but back to this particular structure. I say this is a great example of um, Frederick the Great's enlightened monarchy. He took over Silesia. It was a land grab. It was very aggressive, arguably immoral. Austria had done nothing to provoke uh, uh, Prussia. Prussia just says, we want it, and oh, there, it's ours. So that was a mean and aggressive move, but Frederick would say, I'm expanding and strengthening the state of Prussia. And he would also say behind closed doors probably that he had no respect for Maria Theresa as a female ruler. But then after he captures Silesia, Silesia, this old Habsburg land, it's so Catholic. Everybody there is Catholic because they're part of the Habsburg domain. They're all Catholic. So in response to that, he builds St. Hedwig's Cathedral to show these new people of his growing state I respect you, here is a cathedral for you. And it shows how monarchs at this point in time in history, after the previous century of religious wars, the monarchs now are becoming more and more secular. Secular not in that they didn't have their own religion or not even that there weren't state religions still. I mean, Prussia is a Lutheran state, but there is at least religious tolerance. As Frederick the Great said, every man must get to heaven in his own way. Um, I have a few pictures from inside at St. Hedwig's Cathedral. I really enjoyed going inside St. Hedwig's Cathedral when I was there in 2014. Here's a nice big organ. My photo photographs couldn't do it any justice because it's just so huge inside of it. I couldn't back up far enough to get a good uh, shot of uh, what I was seeing. Uh, this is the inside of the dome standing straight beneath the, uh, the, the apex of it and I'm standing, obviously, directly beneath the apex of it, taking a photograph up. And it's just pretty impressive. It um, has sort of a dizzying, hypnotic effect. If you take a look at the interior of it, it's just kind of neat how it's, how it's built. Um, there's two levels of it, but it's open. Like, the lower level can look up into the, into the, to the upper level. So if you actually attended Mass in this particular cathedral, um, you see the altar that would be there to the right... Uh, the people would sit up in this upper level, which is uh, you know, open to the windows, and then the choir is actually below. And so the choir would sit below, and the choir would sing, and so the music would come up from the floor below. It was, um, I thought it was kind of a cool setup. There's also a, uh, a, a, a perfect replica of Michelangelo's Pieta that's in, the, that's in St. Peter's Cathedral in Rome. Um, it's the exact same size and dimensions and everything as the original Michelangelo's. And it's down uh, below where the choir is in St. Hedwig's. And also, I, one last thing about St. Hedwig's, I wanted to see St. Hedwig's. And when I was in Berlin, we had a, um, a cab driver and I was trying to ask him, I was like, you know, I wanted to go to St. Hedwig's Cathedral. So I kept saying, you know, you know, Heilige Hedwig's Dom, <laughs> St. Hedwig's Cathedral. And he didn't know what I was talking about. And he said, I, and he'd been a cab driver in Berlin for forever. And I was describing it. And he said, oh, you just mean the Berlin Cathedral. So I think the people in Berlin don't even know its proper name of St. Hedwig's. They simply call it the Berliner Dom or the Berlin Cathedral. All right. Another excellent example of Frederick's enlightened monarchy involves potatoes. Potatoes. All right. So potatoes are indigenous to the Americas. The Europeans didn't know anything about potatoes until after 1492 and uh, Christopher Columbus coming to the Americas and opening up the Americas to uh, Europeans' colonization. But once the potato is discovered, 
the potato becomes this very versatile food in Europe. Because the potato is so resilient, it grows nearly in, in anywhere. It's a starch, it's a good food, it fills you up, it's excellent to make sure that your people don't starve. So most European countries embrace the potato. Famously, as we will learn about, the Irish begin to subsist almost exclusively on potatoes, which is fine until the Irish potato famine of the mid middle 19th century, and we'll learn about that later. But so the potato, it is during the reign of Frederick the Great that he wants to introduce the potato into Prussia. And so this is an example of enlightened monarchy. So science and reason tells us that potato, a potato is a great crop to grow. It's resilient. You can grow it nearly anywhere. You can feed your people. You can prevent starvation. We need to grow potatoes based upon logical, rational reasoning. We're going to break from tradition. We're going to grow potatoes. It's a new thing. The thing is, there were many farmers in Prussia that were resistant to this because farmers tend to be very conservative. They don't like to break from tradition. For many farmers, you simply do what you've always done. And this is because farming is such a dangerous thing. You're subject to the whims of the weather. Sometimes you have good crops, sometimes you have bad crops. And once you figure out a system for farming, you stick with it. You don't do anything experimental. So Frederick the Great did this little PR stunt to drum up interest in the potatoes, and that was this. In each little region around Prussia, he had on these small patches of Junker estates, potatoes, a, a little I don't know, potato farm. And this little potato farm was guarded by Prussian troops so that the peasants would be like, what's going on there? And they'd go and they'd check it out. And these you know, troops would have to tell them, you know, the king's growing potatoes here. And after that first batch of potatoes was harvested and people realized what a great crop they are and how good they are, well, then most of the farmers in Prussia want to start growing potatoes. So here's an image of Sans Souci. This is next to the palace. You can't see the palace from this particular angle, but you see on the ground there is the grave of Frederick the Great. And you can't really read it, but it says Friedrich de Grossa, Frederick the Great. And that's where he's buried. And if you take a look on his grave, there's a couple of potatoes because it's tradition. When you visit the grave of Frederick the Great, you lay a potato on it. And then you see his gravestone is by itself. And then if you look up the photograph there, those, all, the, all those other gravestones, those are the graves of his dogs. He was buried next to his greyhounds. And so these are some of the things that make Frederick the Great a significant enlightened monarch of the 18th century. Again, some of the things to highlight about Frederick the Great and his rule, if ever you have to write about Frederick the Great and how he's, a, how he's an, an enlightened ruler, potatoes is always a good thing to mention, and agricultural reforms. Uh, the construction of Hedwig's, St. Hedwig's Cathedral in, in, in Berlin and religious toleration. To a certain extent, new military organization. And then you can also use sort of on the side Bach and the music, the Baroque music of Bach during the Enlightenment as an example of the Enlightenment. Okay, but now we need to go back to this whole balance of power thing and the ongoing conflict between Maria Theresa, Empress of, all, of Austria, and Frederick II, the King of Prussia. So when we left off with the end of the War of Austrian Succession in 1748, in the middle of the 18th century, Austria and Maria Theresa, has, they have been humiliated. Silesia has been stolen from them, and all of Europe is now looking at Prussia as this new rising powerhouse in the middle of Europe. And Maria Theresa wants vengeance. She wants vengeance against Prussia. So how is she going to get it? Well, once again, I've got this word here in the middle of the slideshow again. Balance of power. Again, just an important idea. How do we maintain peace in Europe at this point in time in history? Well, we make sure that no one single country gets too big and too powerful. And there is a balance of the powerful states in Europe. So England, France, Spain, Austria, Russia... If any of these countries gets too powerful, then the rest of them will team up against that one country. And now we've got this new player on the scene, Prussia. Okay, so what you're looking at on the screen here is how Maria Theresa decides to fight Prussia. She initiates vengeance through diplomacy. And this is the diplomatic revolution of 1756.
Okay, so after the War of Austrian Succession, everybody's a little nervous about Prussia, and Maria Theresa decides to use that nervousness to her advantage. So she sends diplomats, diplomats out to Versailles in France, and she sends diplomats to St. Petersburg in Russia to create an alliance, a military alliance against Prussia. Now, the reason why she reaches out to these two countries is geographic in nature mostly because Fr Russia and France are the two superpowers on either side of Prussia. And if you're looking at the map, you're like, uh, yeah, but there's still a lot of stuff in between Prussia and France and between Prussia and Russia, but you can never mind all that stuff. In terms of a powerful state, France and Russia are on either side of Prussia. So you can sort of disregard Poland and you can disregard all the many little states in the Holy Roman Empire. So the goal here is very simple. Surround Prussia with enemies. So this way, if P Prussia tries to pull any more crap again, if they try to steal any more land from Austria, Prussia is going to get hammered from three sides. Austria is going to attack them and France and Russia. Prussia is going to get sandwiched between three powerful countries. So hopefully that's clear as you look at this map. By this way, this map's in French. This is the only map I could find online several years ago when I was looking for it for the diplomatic revolution of 1756. So it's a, it's a nice French map. You'll notice that uh, Prussia has its allies too. Uh, you've got England that's allied with Hanover in Germany. That's no big deal because the, the English kings at this time, the Georges, George, George the I, George the II, George the Third, their family is originally from Hanover, which is why this is the Hanoverian dynasty. Hanover is a state in the northern part of the Holy Roman Empire. And at some point in time uh, during all this, the two northern German states of Hanover and Prussia created an alliance. That alliance up there on top doesn't really matter. The big alliance is Russia with Austria with France. Three very powerful countries. Russia is emerging as a power at this time, expanding under the reign of Catherine II, known as Catherine the Great. And all three of these countries pose a serious threat to Prussia. Now, there's something else that's going on here, which is a major historical break. Austria is now allied with France. This is a huge diplomatic breakthrough because throughout, this entire, throughout the entirety of this course so far, France has always been mortal enemies with the Habsburgs. And of course, Maria Theresa is from the Habsburg line. They're Austrian. The French and the Austrians don't like each other historically. But what we see in the 18th century is that the Holy Roman Empire doesn't seem to matter that much anymore. The Habsburgs have given up ruling it. You've got just all these little local rulers. And so France doesn't really see the Holy Roman Empire on its border as any type of threat anymore. They are concerned about the growth of Prussia and what would happen if Prussia then took over the Holy Roman Empire and create a new super Prussian state, then France has something to fear. So France and Austria are now united by a common enemy. But this is still a major, important diplomatic breakthrough. And as diplomatic alliances are sealed at this point in time in history, it will involve a marriage. And this is why Maria Theresa takes, has her youngest daughter, whose name is Marie Antoinette, marry the future king of France, Louis XVI. And Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette, we will learn a whole lot about them during, the, during our unit on the French Revolution. The alliance between Austria and Russia is fairly strong, and it will hold for nearly 100 years. It starts to break down in the 1840s. And then in the 1850s, Austria will completely betray Russia. But we got a ways to go before we learn about that. But here's the new alliance system. This is important. The diplomatic revolution of 1756 because it then sparks a new war. Because if you're Frederick II up in Prussia, you find out about this, how do you respond? Three super powerful countries on your borders have just all allied against you. You know they don't like you. They know they look at you as a threat to the balance of power. You know there's a good chance that they might all team up and invade and, as, and they'll just use Silesia as an excuse to come in and, and take over your country. So what do you do? Your options are do nothing, just wait. They haven't declared war or anything yet. Or you've got a professional army. You're ready to go. Do you strike first? So this is the problem with Prussia. And this is later on the problem with Germany because Germany will find itself in almost the exact same situation in the year 1914. 
Prussia, and also the rest of the German states, they don't really have any natural boundaries. They're in the middle of Europe. They could be attacked at any time, and if they're attacked on both sides at the same time, it's really hard to fight and to defend yourself. So if you're the leader of the country, if you're like Frederick II here, do you wait for the inevitable and your country to get invaded, or do you simply strike first? Uh, in the case of both Frederick II in the year 1756 and in the case of the German Empire in 1914, they will not wait to be invaded. They'll say simply by creating this alliance system around us and lining up armies on our border, this is pretty much a declaration of war and we're not waiting for you to come in, we're going after you. All right. So Frederick is going to strike first, and this is going to initiate what we call the Seven Years' War. Now, the Seven Years' War, you have studied this war before in your eighth grade United States history class. You didn't call it the Seven Years' War, though. You called it the French and Indian War, which is what it was called over here. Over here in the American colonies, Britain and France were fighting for possession of North America. So if you remember on that diplomatic revolution image, England and France were not allied with each other. They were on the opposite side of each other. They were enemies with each other. And of course, the British and the French had both had settlements in North America. There were some territorial disputes. Diplomacy didn't work and war erupted. Now, one of the reasons why the British won the French and Indian War over here was because Britain, for the, Britain stayed out of the conflict on the continent. But France was busy fighting the Prussians in Europe and then also the British in North America. So their resources were spread really, really thin. And while France was spreading its resources thin, the Prime Minister of Britain put a whole bunch of money into winning the North American conflict. And so Britain wins over here, which is why we're speaking English in Ohio today and not French. So Frederick the Great indirectly played a role in the political development of North America. All right, on the screen right now are... Uh, some of the major conflicts of the seven, seven Years' War. I'll talk about those conflicts in future slides here. This will be the major campaign of Frederick the Great's rule. This is really where he earns the name Old Fritz. He spent a lot of time in the saddle. He spent a lot of time personally in battle. It's sort of amazing he never got killed. Bullets went through his hat, his coat, killed his horses, but he never got hit. In the latter half of the 1750s, he's going to travel on horse over 1,000 miles, going from campaign to camp, or going from battle to battle to battle, and proves himself to be an inspirational leader for his men. Now, here's how you can understand the Seven Years' War geographically. So, this is a map that I made, and you'll notice that I numbered one, two, and three. So, here's what you're looking at here Frederick the Great is not going to wait for armies to come to him, he is going to go and attack armies. But these armies, the armies of his enemies that were established during the diplomatic revolution of 1756, they are already assembled and they are already preparing to attack. So instead of letting them all attack at once, he's going to send his army out. Let me say that differently. He's going to lead his army out to engage his three enemies at three different times. And so the battles occur in a counterclockwise fashion. So first there's the French, and the French make allies with the Bavarians too, and the French move in. And he goes down, he's going to fight the French first, and then the Austrians are going to come up from the south. He's going to fight the Austrians second, and then he's going to go east, and he's going to fight the Prussians third. So one, two, and three, France, Austria, Russia. All right, that's my silly little map. This looks like a much nicer map, doesn't it? Somebody else made this map. I stole it. But there you go. In counterclockwise fashion, France first, Aust Austria next. Russia third. Little Prussia facing off against three massive armies. All right, so I'm going to talk about these battles one by one. You do not need to know the name or the details of the battles, but I do want to give you a sense of the military genius of Frederick the Great and what he does to win these battles. Not all of them, as you'll see, but the battles against the French and the Austrians, he wins decisively. So I'm going to try to give you a sense of how Frederick is considered to be a military genius, and then also the final outcome of the Seven Years' War and what it means to European history. Okay, so the first battle was the Battle of Rossbach, and it happens uh, here geographically. Um, so you've got France uh, combined forces with Bavaria, and they are attacking Prussia from the west. And I'll just first show you the numbers from the battle. And the numbers should give you a strong sense of how brilliant 
of, an, of a commander Frederick is. The French had five, or excuse me, no, ten times the casualties at, as the Prussians did. So the Prussians had less than 500 dead and wounded, and then the French and the Bavarians, I guess the French and the Bavarians, they had 5,000 dead or wounded. In terms of a battle, Frederick did something kind of amazing here. Just the numbers tell us that. And there's this quote here on the bottom that says, the trap is sprung, which, re which relates to how Frederick won this particular battle. So as a military commander, the greatest thing that you can do is completely surround your enemy. If you can surround your enemy, you win, right? They're, the enemy's completely surrounded. There's nothing they can do. There's no place they can, there's no place they can go. They could potentially fight themselves out of, this, out of being surrounded, but that's very difficult to do. So the ultimate goal of any battle is to surround your enemy. And with his highly disciplined Prussian force, that's exactly what Frederick II does. And he creates a trap for his enemies. He lures them into the trap, and then he surrounds them. And so here's how he does it. <laughs> I hope this works, guys. This is a little silly little thing that I made. I hope it works for you. All right, so here's what Frederick II does. So the, you've got the French and Bavarian forces versus the Prussian force. French are coming from the west, Prussians are in the east. All right, so we start off here. First thing Frederick does is he sends a vanguard force off to engage the French and Bavarian forces. So the Prussians initiate the fight. The French and Bavarians see the Prussians coming at them, and they fight, they fight, and they fight, and they fight. While this is going on, two other Prussian units split off from the central Prussian force in a flanking maneuver. They are going to secretively and quickly get around to either side of the French and Bavarian forces. All right, then the original vanguard force that had engaged the French and Bavarians, they make like they're giving up and they turn around and they retreat, they retreat, they retreat, they retreat, and they're running back to the central Prussian force, thus giving the French and Bavarians a sense that, ha ha, we are winning, we are driving them back. So let's go chase them and wipe them out. And that's the trap. So the French and Bavarian forces, they come in to engage what they think is the central force of the Prussians. But next thing they know, they're getting attacked on either side by other Prussian units. They're like, where did these guys come from? And then, of course, from the two flanking Prussian units that are on either side of the French and Bavarian forces, some of them split off to go behind the French and Bavarian forces, and now they're completely surrounded and it's all over. Battle of Rossbach, 1757. The French and the Bavarians got wiped out, so now here comes Austria. They're going directly up to Prussia. It's almost like the Austrians are thinking, well, while the French and the Bavarians are fighting, Frederick II will get up there and invade Prussia proper. The intel of this reaches Frederick II, and he has to move his men within weeks to go and engage the Austrians after they've just secured this major victory against the French. The Battle of Leuten, also 1757. Numbers, not quite as great, but still significant. This battle is remembered for a song all the Prussians started singing, the Hymn of Leuten. These men just got done fighting and winning a major battle. Now, Almost immediately, they have to march for weeks to go and engage the Austrians to fight another major battle in the same way. And do they lose spirit? Do they lose hope? No, they sing a song, the Hymn of Leuten, and the Prussians win. So for what it's worth, the Hymn of Leuten became a movie in Nazi Germany in the 1940s, because Nazi Germany in the 1940s was fighting World War II, and Nazi Germany was completely surrounded by enemies on all sides. So Hitler's propaganda minister, Josef Goebbels, commissions the production of this film, The Hymn of Leuten, to remind the Germans in the 1940s that we've been surrounded before. But do we give up hope? No, we fight. So sing the Hymn of Leuten. All right, so France knocked out. Austria knocked out. Now there's one more enemy to fight. Here comes Russia. The Russians are coming from the east. They have approximately 43,000 men. The Prussians only have 36,000 men. The Prussian army goes out to the east. They're war-hardened, but they are extraordinarily tired. In the year 1758, they face off against the Russians at the Battle of Zorndorf. There was major loss of life for both the Prussians and the Russians. In this one battle, the Prussians, 
12,800 casualties. The Russians, 18,000 casualties. But who wins? Russia. Prussia's retreating. And the Prussian military machine at home starts going into, into, into overdrive. Train the men. Discipline the men. We have to defend Prussia against Russia. The Battle of Kunersdorf, the following year, 1759. 50,000 Prussians versus 65,000 Russians. Nearly the same casualties on each side. And these are, once again, astronomical casualties. 25,000 Prussian casualties, 23,000 Russian casualties. Who wins? Russia. The Battle of Kunersdorf was decisive. The Prussian soldiers turned on their heels and they fled in disorder, screaming, running away from the Russians who are now going to march on Berlin. Frederick, who had led his men in the battle, amazingly survives this battle. He writes a letter back to the government in Berlin, which seems to be a suicide note. But it's interesting, this particular letter, uh, it's worth taking a brief look at just to give us a sense of the 18th century, the age of the Enlightenment. Uh, to, if you can, uh, look at your screen and, and, and check out this letter that was written in 1759 after the Battle of Kunersdorf. This letter begins, if you can read it so, sort of, J'ai attaqué ce matin à 11 heures l'ennemi, nous les avons jusqu'à something, something, something. That's not German. That's French. And it just goes to show the impact of French culture on, the, on Europe in the 18th century, as well as Frederick's love of the French and French culture. This letter that he writes, which might have been the last letter that he wrote, had other forces that we'll learn about here in a second not intervened. But it's interesting that Frederick wanted to write the last thing, the suicide note, in French, not in his native tongue of German. But this letter does give us a sense of what happened at Kunersdorf and how terrible things were. He wrote, uh, and this is in English, this is the English translation. Uh, this morning at 11 o'clock, I have attacked the enemy. All of my troops have worked wonders, but at a cost of innumerable losses. Our men got into confusion. I assembled them three times. In the end, I was in danger of getting captured and had to retreat. My coat is perforated by bullets. Two horses of mine have been shot dead. My misfortune is that I am still living. Our defeat is very considerable. To me remains 3,000 men from an army of 48,000 men. At the moment in which I report all this, everyone is on the run. I am no more master of my troops. Thinking of the safety of anybody in Berlin is a good activity. It is a cruel failure that I will not survive. The consequences of, this, of the battle will be worse than the battle itself. I do not have any more resources and, frankly confess, I believe that everything is lost. I will not survive the doom of my fatherland. Farewell forever. Adieu jamais. So it seems like from the last two sentences that he's going to commit suicide, but he doesn't, in fact. But his statement in the middle there, thinking of the safety of anybody in Berlin as a good activity, that was spot on because here come the Russians. The Russian troops show up into Berlin and they loot it. And then the Russian military stations itself in the Charlottenburg Palace, which is still there in Berlin today. There was plenty of German imagery of the Russians completely taking over Berlin by 1760 pillaging what they wanted, and beginning the occupation of Prussia. Now, it's 1760. If we could just pause history right here and look at what's happened, you may have some questions about how the world could possibly be the way that it is today. In 1760, there is no Prussia. Russia has taken over Berlin. Russia has now expanded into Central Europe, Russia is the biggest country in the world, and they're allied with Austria and France. This is the long-term result of Peter the Great in Russia building up the Russian military and the Russian navy. But these were, of course, the ground forces that, uh, that defeated the Prussians. Okay, but let's just pause history here. 1760. If this is the state of Europe in 1760... Shouldn't Russia be the most powerful country in the world? That, and how can Germany even exist? Had this situation held in 1760, Prussia would, never, would not exist. It'd be, a, it'd be a state of Russia. It would have gone on to be controlled by Russia. Here come the Russians. Here comes the Russian Orthodox Church. The Prussians would be an oppressed minority people within the greater Russian state. 
Berlin would be controlled directly by St. Petersburg, the capital of Russia, and therefore there is no Germany. So Prussia never goes on to unite the other German states to create the state of Germany to start two world wars in the 20th century that gets the United States of America involved in European affairs. None of that happens. Had this particular situation of 1760 lasted. So what the heck happened? Russia's so big, Russia's so powerful, Russia's controlling Eastern Europe and Central Europe. What happened? Well, what did happen is almost too silly for words. Now's the part of the story you're gonna think a kindergartner like came up with this. It just, it doesn't make sense. Like you don't think adults would act like this, but <laughs> Russia is gonna lose its power and Prussia is gonna come back in a way that, well, like I said, it's almost too stupid for words. Okay, let's talk about Russia. Here's the leader of Russia during the period of time of the Seven Years' War. This is yet another female nemesis of Frederick the Great, Tsarina Elizabeth I. Tsarina Elizabeth I is the daughter of Peter the Great and Peter's second wife, Tsarina Catherine I. Tsarina Elizabeth I is the powerful ruler of Russia, and she couldn't have been more proud of the size and growth of the Russian state under her leadership. I'm sure in his grave, Peter the Great would have been very proud of his daughter, Elizabeth. But then, in the year 1762, Elizabeth dies, and her imperial throne in St. Petersburg is passed to her nephew. Her nephew, who was born and raised in the German state of Holstein, is Tsar Peter III. And Tsar Peter III is an imbecile. He's not, well, I guess I can't say he's not an adult man. Physically, he's an adult man, but that's sort of where the adult-like qualities end. Peter III was a boy stuck in the body of a man. He was an imbecile. Some of his favorite pastimes were sticking his tongue out at aristocracy and making faces at them while they were at dinner together and playing with toy soldiers. And students, he's in his 30s when he inherits the throne. He's an imbecile, which is why he doesn't rule for too long. He'll eventually be killed by his wife, Catherine II, and she'll go on to rule Russia and she'll become Catherine the Great. But not before this. Peter III's idol was Frederick the Great. So the first thing that Peter III did when he became the Tsar of Russia was to show respect to Frederick the Great by having all of the Russian troops dress up in Prussian blue uniforms and retreat out of Prussia. This was to show, res re show respect to Frederick the Great, but what Peter just did was completely humiliate his own military, which is why the military commanders will play no small part in helping his wife kill him later on. The other thing he does, Tsar Peter III, is to help Frederick the Great restore all of the boundaries of Prussia, all of the original boundaries of Prussia prior to the Seven Years' War. The Seven Years' War on the continent is now over. There's been immense loss of life in Prussia and throughout Europe, and yet all that happens is we return to status quo antebellum. We return to the way things were before the war. Nothing changed. We will learn a little bit more about Peter III and his very important wife, Catherine II, who goes on to become Catherine the Great, and the story of Russia in the future. The Prussians were very happy to have peace, so a few years after the death of Frederick the Great, the Prussians built this Brandenburg Gate in the heart of Berlin. It is still an icon of Berlin today. Two decades after the Seven Years' War, the American colonists were busy fighting for their freedom. Interestingly, the great absolute monarch, but enlightened monarch, Frederick II, showed admiration to George Washington and in support of George Washington, sent him his sword. So if you visit uh, George Washington's estate of Mount Vernon, Virginia today, there is on display a sword from Frederick the Great. Frederick the Great died in the middle of the 1780s. Here's his gravestone from Sans Souci. You saw it once before, now you can actually read it. Friedrich de Grossa, Frederick the Great, 
And on the corner, there's flowers. And on the other corner, there's a couple of potatoes. So now that we're done with the military history of the 18th century, let me go back to this slide. Because if you can understand this slide and how one thing leads to another, then you understand the developments, uh, the military developments of uh, the 18th century. So you have the War of Spanish Succession that starts off. France tries to become a superpower. England says no, led by the Duke of Marlborough. We've got to protect the balance of power. The English create an allied force on the continent, which actually, uh, during the War of Spanish Succession, involved the Prussians. The Prussians aided the, the, the English in that battle. And they made sure that the King of Spain, who was a Bourbon, would never be the King of France. The English and their allies won. And then we've got the pragmatic sanction of 1713, Charles VI of Austria trying to make sure that everybody in Europe respects the uh, monarchy and the legitimate reign of his daughter, Maria Theresa. Pragmatic sanction established in 1713, but then he dies in 1740. Maria Theresa becomes the empress of Austria in 1740. That's the exact same year by coincidence. Frederick II becomes the king of Prussia, 1740, and then the war is on. Prussia invades Silesia to take it over, and the War of Austrian Succession begins. Prussia wins, gets to keep Silesia. Maria Theresa, really upset, establishes the diplomatic revolution in 1756, a few years later, creating an alliance with France and Austria and Russia. Frederick the Great doesn't like being surrounded, and so he initiates the Seven Years' War, which does nothing to change the map of Europe. So hopefully, all that makes sense. What you see in the 18th century, some of the big ideas, some of the most powerful and important monarchies are those that are enlightened. Maria Theresa is a bit, of a, a, a bit of an anomaly there because she makes all of these progressive reforms, but she does them because of her Catholic faith, not because she has any respect for Enlightenment thinking. But we have the emergence of powerful Enlightened monarchs. The other Enlightened monarch that I haven't talked about yet, Catherine II of Russia. At least I haven't talked about her in depth yet. You have the emergence of Prussia as a significant power, disrupting the balance of power over Europe. And that's, that's where we end with this particular lecture. All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed it. hope you enjoyed learning about the diplomatic and military history of Europe in the 18th century. Maria Theresa, Frederick II, aren't they great? I love them. All right, that's it, guys. I will see you in class.